Welcome back to the Redbird Pavilion. Nice to know if it starts raining, we're going to be uh, dry in here. Also want to thank Tempest and Avemco for supporting us in this endeavor. Really enjoying doing this live broadcasting so far. It's a little bit new for us, but it's, uh, it's an exciting thing, like starting to build an airplane almost. But, uh, so we've seen uh, uh, the Kit Fox 40th anniversary. We had Chris Gaiman up here earlier from Lycoming. Uh, with me is Tom Wilson. He's a longtime staffer for us, a contributor for us. And a guy I call my engine guy. He's, uh, I would say he's got 30 weight in his blood, but maybe his doctor wouldn't like to hear that. Uh, definitely been watching the industry for a long time, has some perspective on it, writes our big uh, engine buyer's guide that goes in kit planes every year. And uh, Tom, thanks for dropping in. Absolutely. What, what's your take on the experimental market these days? There's a lot of lot of stuff in play. What what What's sort of the big stuff for you? I, I think you could say it's in flux. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, yeah, we've got uh, obviously our traditional engines uh, with uh, Lycoming Continental, and I would say now Rotex. And, uh, then you have the uh, up and comers or the outliers. And I think there's a window of opportunity here just because of uh, the supply issues and the uh, price increasing uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, I think the, the price increases have, are what's the real driver now in that uh, you know, there's, a, there's a certain level that the market can handle. And uh, at, the, at the bottom end of that, at the entry level, the, there's some of these, uh, shall we say, alternative engines that are gaining some traction. We'll come back to that, but I'm, I'm curious about your take on, you know, we, we had Lycoming coming here, the Thunderbolt was uh, obviously a successful brand for them, sub-brand for them, and clearly a reaction to what engine shops were doing back in the day. You know, you had kit engines, you had guys who wanted to hot rod their engines, and their solution was to go to an engine shop to do it, because Lycoming coming was only selling, and Continental too, right. was selling bone stock engines. So it's, it's interesting to see that performance aspect change. Uh, but what's the life like for a shop these days? I mean, I know that some of the parts availability was an issue. You've just been to Lycon. We had a nice story in our ultimate right. issue. What's like life like on the ground for them? Life like there is it, it's a little bit of a story of last man standing. Yeah. There has been a, a kind of a weeding out of some of the what used to be just engine shops everywhere. And they're consolidating. And so the last engine shops are now very busy. So. They have a little bit of a lead time issue just from that, as well as the parts. But uh, th these other, these main shops, Lycon, Barrett, uh, uh, Aerosport Power, yep. yeah, uh, they have been gaining more and more capability uh, for better and better builds, and they're gaining more market share. They're they're sucking it all up, and yeah, they're. They're turning it out. I would say one of their great strengths right now is the lead time. Um, you know, eight months or maybe under a year, which is definitely much better than you know buying it from the factory. So that that is, an, and they're bringing more and more capabilities in house. You know, the, uh, Lycon just added a, a case shop, for example, which is you know they don't have to necessarily go to Divco. They don't want to compete with Divco. It's just for their own in house engine builds but it gives them more control, uh, more quality insurance, and uh, a little help with the lead time. And I think it's fair to say that those kinds of shops, you know, like coming with the, the Thunderbolt line, can kind of mix and match, but generally kind of has lanes, right? So they, yep. they have specific builds based on what the OEs, the vans, and whatnot would call for. But an engine shop like Lycon or Barrett, you know, pretty much any combination that they could get parts for, they'll build for you. Anything you want, yeah. And they do, and they and they've been doing that uh, for so many years. And they have some of their own parts, uh, you know, some smaller items, but uh, especially like Lycon, especially uh, pistons, high compression pistons. What compression do you want? Do you want a five to one piston for a turbo application? <laughs> you know, do you want a fourteen to one? Anything in between. Yeah. So yeah, they're they're definitely uh, have this ability to solve that custom niche, uh, dress up parts, paint, all that. They. Those aftermarket companies are the ones that basically taught the OEMs that this was a market yeah. and to get into that market. 
Yeah, it was a little like, you guys are having too much fun with all this stuff. We, we, better, yeah. we better get a taste of that. Yeah. So, uh, it, it's definitely been interesting to watch over the years uh, and the development of that. And especially, I think Lycon is, is an interesting case study in bringing those capabilities in-house and answering some sort of long-standing questions with engines, uh, case sealing, things like that, that are kind of take it to the next level. That may not make sense for Lycoming at the scale that it needs to do it, but on the, the on the smaller scale and the, and the more detailed scale for the individual builder, it kind of does make sense. It is the advantage of the custom shop, yes. The uh, and they do have some really interesting capabilities, like the, the case ceiling and and uh, they're they're just making a better engine. The cylinder ceiling is getting better and better. The tension, um, the ability to build so many custom engines, race engines, performance aerobatic engines. Uh, they have so many opportunities to try different uh, cylinder wall finishes, ring finishes, uh, working with total seal, and that they're getting that cylinder drier and drier, getting more and more compression out, it's getting more efficient, the core product is just getting better, and this does pay off to the, the standard guy, the certified product, which is the, really the bread and butter of those aftermarket. They're always, yes, they do build really wild motors and whatever you want, but their bread and butter, 70% of it is still, you know, IRANs, prop strikes, yeah. certified overhauls, and that product is getting better from the experimental experience. And I would say it's getting better also from a racing experience. You followed Reno closely, oh, yeah. you're, you're kind of an embedded journalist with some of those guys, and uh, you've seen what some of those guys do with the engines, and there's, you know, I, I look at the boost figures for some of those, and that just think, it makes me kind of cringe a little bit. Accelerated but. durability testing, yes. But but it's uh, a real crucible, right? Just like racing is, and they can take some of that back into the, to the manufacturing. What examples of that have you seen that really impress you? Well, um, the Sport Gold Racers, we'll say Reno, but it's not Reno anymore, but those Sport Gold Racers uh, have really pushed the cylinder pressures. So you have to really leverage them, but they're running over 100 inches of manifold pressure at times. Oh, and uh, I mean, 90 is kind of like racing. Yeah. And uh, at those levels, those parts are definitely stressed. And you know, outside of the engine, there's a whole bunch of cooling that they've learned. They've taught us a, a tremendous amount about how to cool those things. It, it, what's really amazing is they run those pressures, those 900 horsepower power level at times, and yet their cylinder head temperatures are, are better than yours when you're cruising. It's all, it's all about care in the execution and the design. And we, we, we learn and, a lot. And spraying a whole bunch of water on the inside and the outside of the engine. Yeah. <laughs> it washes the belly of the airplane <laughs> yeah. as you fly. It's, about, yeah. it's, a great, it's a great feature. So let, let's switch gears just a little bit. Now we've, we've had the big conventional engines and those have been the mainstay for the experimental market for a long time. Uh, but we have a few new players. I mean, Rotax is definitely making some inroads. And I don't want to forget to come back to the alternative engines, but, but what's your take on what Rotax is doing and kind of where that leads? I'm extremely impressed by Rotax. Um, they're running higher cylinder pressures than those Sport Gold races that we were just talking about. You know, production engine on MoGas with a you know big long TBO, a warranty, it's just incredible. Now, a lot of that has to do with just the fundamentals of the giant bore in a traditional engine. You know, you got a five and an eight bore. And, uh, you know, it's the flame front needs to get a passport to get from one side of the cylinder to the other. You know, it's true. Yeah, it's, it's a, you know, it's a campfire inside the barn like we were talking. And and that that flame front just, that's, it's just physics. Uh, those are inherently low RPM engines. Yeah. And, and this, the, uh, shall we say, historical uh, cylinder shape and all that just kind of limits them to a certain amount of pressure. Yeah. Whereas Rotax is uh, in constant development. They're developing new things all the time, little processes, and they're already, like with a 916, very impressive engine, very high pressures. They're, they're getting efficiency by putting pressure in that cylinder. And let's not forget the electronic controls. Right. Very important. That, that fully integrated engine. Uh, it reminds me a lot of what I saw in automotive, which is a tremendously you know, huge industry which has been developing this stuff. Rotex is doing very well. And, and certainly they're on the path to develop that. Uh, you know, it, it's logical that they would eventually end up in the 180 to 220 horsepower range yes. and beyond that. 
What I've noticed from Rotex though is they're really methodical about it. So if you're expecting it to show up next week, you're probably going to be disappointed. Uh, and they're also really in, invested in, in launching the engines with a reasonable TBO. 916 came out with a 2,000 hour TBO. If you think back in time, it took Lycoming and Continental a long time to get engines to that point. Well, this is part of their success. I mean, they, they have the, the discipline to bring it out only when it's ready. Yeah. Right. So, you know, it's nice to know you're, as a customer, you're not doing R&D. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Last point for us today, uh, alternative engines. I think, uh, as we talked about earlier, there's a little sunlight to be had for some of these because of the, the cost increases and the delays in availability and things like that. And, and my take on it is that it's a matured in, or maturing industry. It was a little wild west there for a long time. And what we're seeing now is a lot more development in that direction. And I'm talking about auto engine conversions as well as some alternative engines that were designed around that. You got one minute to answer. One minute. <laughs> well, it is a little bit still the Wild West. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they've actually, you know, they've moved out of tents and they're actually in buildings now. And, and so, yes, there is development. There's, there are automotive conversions that are in series production. The, the gearboxes have come along. There's always a, you know, a, a problem with it. Yeah. Those seem to be working quite well. Uh, the next step would be a, just larger scale, yeah. I believe. So, but at the time, they do have some advantages, uh, you know, in the lower horsepower ranges that they can deliver very quickly. Uh, they seem to be reliable. There is, we have a very low fleet hours to go by. So that, you know, we, it's, there's always that question. But so far, it's looking good. I like to hear that. I like to, like to see the choices. So uh, I think it's a, a, a fairly good outlook. I mean, we have some economic issues still to deal with uh, and availability, which is a, a little stressing for some, but I think the options are still there in the experimental market. And as a lot of these mature and the and we have wider choices for a lot of builders, especially on the lower end side, I say light end side, I don't mean low end side, but right. the lighter aircraft yeah. uh, that I think portends pretty well. It is, and I, I think we're kind of on the cusp. I, I, as these trends continue, I think I, we, we're spoiled for choice, really, at the moment, and I think that trend is going to continue, and we're going to have more choices as we go forward. I like I like that a lot. Yeah. Now, now all we need is a really cheap turbine, and we're good. We're good to go, right? Oh, uh, you're dreaming now. I'm dreaming now. <laughs> so, well, thanks for joining us, everybody. This is Tom Wilson, uh, my engine guy, and uh, we got a lot more coming out. Uh, not only today, but we have a few more interesting topics uh, on the kit planes chunk coming up. We're going to be talking to the Vans people. We run out. We're good? What? I gotta... I'm off.